Hello everyone this is part 19 of what if Naruto was the hollow god, and I hope you guys enjoy this video and to like, to subscribe, and check out the playlist, to see more comment down below, now let's start the, intro. Hanata Huga has always been a black sheep of her family. She was a lot like her deceased mother, not just in looks, but her mentality was similar. She was very nice and shy person, who wasn't weak, as the others thought, but was simply too nice to want to harm someone. Her true strength wasn't seen for a long time, and she was fine with that, as she knew that even if her father and the Huga elders knew how strong she was, it wouldn't mean anything, because she was too nice to lead the Huga clan, and in their opinion, would run it into the ground, especially since all she ever wanted was to remove the cursed seal, which the main family, places on the branch family. The elders knew that that would lead to the war between the two sides of the family, because the branch members wants revenge, and without the seal, the main family wouldn't be able to stop them, without having to fight them, and that would lead to the clan's destruction. As such, Hanata was not suited to lead the clan, regardless of her power and skill. Her younger sister though, was perfect. She was everything the Huga wanted in their clan head. She was powerful, had skill, talent, and knew perfectly well what would happen if the cursed seal was removed from the heads of the branch Huga members. Everyone in the Huga clan, knew of Hanata's love, infatuation for Naruto Uzumaki, and none was happy for that. They saw Naruto as a simply orphan brat, and nine tails Jinchiriki at that, thus, he was not deserving of a girl like Hanata. The fact that he was a weak loudmouth, made the things even worse for him. When Naruto was sentenced to death, many in the Huga clan thought that with him dead Hanata will change, and over time get over him. They even hoped that she would become what they always wanted her to be. The perfect future clan leader. Unfortunately for them, Hanata did change after Naruto's death, but not in a way anyone hoped or ever thought possible. After Naruto's death, Hanata became detached from everyone else, not bothering to try and please them. She has simply given up on them, regardless if they are members of her clan, or other people. She did start to show her true strength, though, and has proven to everyone in her clan that they are all a pack of fools, who brag about their all-seeing eyes, but they couldn't see the real Hanata, all those years, and she was living with them. Hanata has focused all her time on training and improving herself, while doing missions, and not paying attention to the others, as she found them bothersome. She wasn't even interested in her teammates any longer, as Kiba was against Naruto and on top of that, was a big pervert, who was constantly trying to get in her pants, not that she can blame him really, as she is really sexy, and is showing that to everyone with the way she is dressing. Shino on the other hand, didn't show Suel interest in Hanata, but he also didn't care that much about Naruto, and even saw logic in Naruto being killed, as he is a Nine Tails Jinchuriki, and can be classified as a danger to the village and the people in it. As for Kurenai, while she wasn't happy about what happened to Naruto and never wanted him dead, she didn't care that much for him anyway, and thought that he isn't good enough for someone like Hanata. While she has proven to be stronger than they all thought right after Naruto's death, it wasn't until the Huga clan wanted to marry Hanata to some rich guy in order to rise their standing in the end, that she has truly shown herself to everyone. Hanata went and threatened to kill every single member of the Huga clan, in a single night, before she would then go and kill the groom and his family, if they even consider marrying her to some guy, who she doesn't know, care about, or loves. She said that she would only even want to marry Naruto, but since he is dead she will remain single until she dies, as she has interest to sully her body with any other man. Regardless of what they might have thought of her, Hanata's father and the Huga elders were scared as hell of Hanata at that moment, and that fear followed them to this day. Every time they even look at her, and see her eyes, all they see is a slow and painful death. So, Hanata was left alone by her clan. From that moment on, she was only carrying Huga name, but no one not even herself, considered her a Huga, as in their eyes she is a traitor, and in her eyes she is above carrying a name of such a simple-minded clan, who only cares about themselves, power and social standing. This has gone for years, until the time when Hanata was in the rain country, watching the battle between Jiraiya and the Akatsuki. Up until then she has considered herself very strong as she was, by that point, stronger than her father, and was at the same level as Kakashi and Guy, not that she bothered to show them. But when she was watching the battle in the rain country, she realized what true power is, 
by watching Jiraiya take on the entire Akatsuki, by himself, and still managed to hold his own and kill some of them. She knew that she would be lucky to just be able to fight and kill one of them. Then, she found out about the fact that there is a new group forming in the Ien, and that the Uzumaki clan is back. She didn't know a lot about the Uzumaki clan, but what she knew, was that they were strong. Since that moment, Hanata started to think if she should just abandon the Leaf Village, and go to find the Uzumaki clan, and ask to join them. She knew that with them she would be safe, and would be able to grow stronger. That fact that she would be around Naruto's family, was only a plus in her book, and would only be better if Naruto was alive to be there with her. And then, while she was thinking on what to do, a miracle happened. An apocalypse has hit the EN, and a lot of places have been destroyed, but that's not the miracle that Hanata was thinking about. The miracle is that the one who caused the apocalypse, was revealed to be none other than, Naruto Uzumaki, who is somehow alive, and has been alive, and going all over the EN, since right after his apparent death. When Hanata has heard that Naruto is alive and well, she was over the moon, and was seen smiling for the first time in over three years. Mind you, this was a true smile, and not one of the fake ones, she was putting from time to time, for one reason or another. As soon as she found out that Naruto is alive, Hanata knew that he is most likely living in the Uzumaki clan homeland, and that's where she can find him. So, she decided that now is the time to abandon the Leaf Village, and leave that part of her life behind her, while starting a new one with Naruto. She has decided that she will tell him about her feelings for him, and that she will be his no matter what. The word has just got out that Danzo has been killed by Sasuke Uchiha, and that the Akatsuki, led by none other than the Madara Uchiha, has declared war on the Ien. As such, while everyone was preparing for the war Hanata decided that it's the right time for her to leave the Leaf Village, as she doesn't know how the things will develop in the coming days, and doesn't want to risk being stuck in the village and forced to participate in the war. There was a problem though. One which Hanata in all her haste to leave as soon as possible, has missed. She was being watched by someone who has seen her pack her stuff, and prepare to leave the Hyuga clan compound, and most likely the village. Not wanting to allow her to leave, that person decided to stop her and then punish her for daring to betray the Hyuga clan, and even try to abandon it. In her haste, Hanata never noticed a shadow behind her, until it was too late, and all she felt was a small tap at the back of her neck, before she was consumed by darkness. XXX. Contrary to what the other may think, Hanabi Hyuga loved her older sister, Hanata. Back when they were younger, the two sisters were very close to each other, and spent a lot of time together. Then, a time came when Hanata started to train, and Hanabi, even though she was very small, could understand that her father, and the Hyuga elders were not happy with Hanata's progress and mentality. In their eyes, Hanata was too weak, both in mind and in her skill. It got even worse when Hanabi started to train, and showed that she was very good in Hyuga Taijutsu, much better than Hanata. From then on, for one reason or another, the two sisters have started to fall apart from each other, and spend less and less time together. The Hyuga elders and Hyashi spent a lot of time with Hanabi, training her to become a worthy clan head, as they have pretty much given up on Hanata becoming one, but they have also spent a lot of time trying to poison Hanabi's mind, and make her hate Hanata. Now, Hanabi Hyuga may be young, but she was not stupid. She could see that her family hates her sister, simply for being so nice. Even the branch family hates Hanata, even if she wishes to help them. They hate her because they all believe that she doesn't deserve to be in the main family, and that she should be one to be branded with a caged bird cursed seal, and not many of the ones who were branded, Neji included. Over the years, Hanabi and Hanata have distanced themselves, but Hanata still loved her little sister, and Hanabi loved her older sister. The two didn't show it, especially Hanabi, because they both knew that Hanabi would be the one to suffer, in case she doesn't reach the expectation of the elders and her own father. As such, Hanabi had to just stand back and watch everything that Hanata has been put through by her own family. She also had to sit back and watch as Hanata changed drastically, after Naruto's death. After Hanata was informed that she was to be married off, and the threat that followed, Hanabi, for the first time in her life, wondered if her sister still loves her or would she kill her as well if her clan continues to push for Hanata's marriage. Thankfully, the Hyuga clan gave up on trying to pressure Hanata to marry, and simply all but forgot about her existence. Unfortunately, Hanabi never got the chance, to this day, to find out if Hanata still loves her and sees her like a sister, or if she sees her as an enemy, just like the rest of their clan. 
For a while now, Hanabi was trying to gather courage and face Hanata, so that she can find out the answer to that question, as it was eating her out. She loves her elder sister, but needs to know if her sister loves her back. So, on this fine night, while she was sure that everyone was sleeping, Hanabi left her room, not even bothering to activate her Byakugan, and find out if there is someone around to see her. It was around one o'clock after midnight, so there is no reason for anyone to be awake. Hanabi slowly walked toward her sister's room, which was just few rooms away from her. Once she got there, Hanabi saw that the door was slightly opened, and there was light in the room. She wondered if Hanata was still awake, which would be good, as she wouldn't have to wake her up. It still made her wonder, why would Hanata be awake, this late at night? Hanabi took a deep breath, and steadied herself, before she walked toward the slightly parted door of Hanata's room, and took a peek. What she saw, was not something she was expecting even in her worst nightmares, and it made her gasp in shock, while her eyes widened as much as possible. XXX. After their talk, Naruto decided not to hate Jiraiya, for pretty much abandoning him in the Leaf Village after his parents' deaths, as he knew that the man wasn't at fault, and that he has simply been too trusting of his teacher. Jiraiya has trusted Haruzen, and Naruto has suffered for that. Of course, Naruto wasn't just going to immediately forgive the men. No, he will let him stew in a little bit. Jiraiya will have to earn his forgiveness. After their talk, Naruto decided to show the new whirlpool to Jiraiya and to introduce him to those he sees as his family. For the next two days, Jiraiya has been introduced to those he didn't know, and has seen those who he did know, like Sunid, Asuma and Conan. He was surprised to find that the three of them are there, and was even more surprised when he found out that Sunid is one of Naruto's lovers. He grinned like a maniac, and even congratulated to Naruto, for managing to bag a woman he wanted, but was never able to get. Naruto was surprised by the good wishes he got from Jiraiya, as he was sure that the men was going to be angry that he got Sunid, when Jiraiya himself, couldn't get her, even though he has been trying for almost his entire life. Jiraiya has spent a lot of the time since he came to the new whirlpool and met everyone, with Conan. She was his former student, and he cared for her, especially now that both Yahiko and Nagato are dead, and with Minato also dead, Conan was the only one of his former students left alive. Naruto can't be classified as his student, as he barely trained him and only taught him the water walking, summoning Jutsu and the Raisingan, then again, that is still more than Kakashi ever taught Naruto, and the men was Naruto's teacher, for months. Jiraiya and Conan spent an entire day, just talking of the old times, when Conan was just a child, and was still Jiraiya's student, before she moved on to talk about everything that happened since Jiraiya left them, and they started their journey, and founded the Akatsuki. While the two of them were talking of the old times, Naruto had a meeting with his closest friends and subordinates. They were talking about the upcoming war, and about what the Great Red told to Naruto. They debated on what to do for a while, until in the end, after the entire day of debate, they came to an agreement on how to best proceed. Naruto said that the Great Red will fight against Bahamut, as he wishes to deal with his arch enemy, once and for all. He then said that he and his blood clones, will take on the elder dragon gods, as the eight of them, should be able to take on the three dragons. The number should neutralize the advantage in power the elder dragons have. The others agreed to this, as they knew that they wouldn't be able to take on anyone, who is stronger than Naruto. Then, Naruto said that the other dragons from the dragon clan, along with Simon, as well as all the other hybrids and hollows, who work with Naruto, will take on the rest of the traitor dragons, and any other enemies that the dragons might coerce into their side. As for the war between the Akatsuki and the rest of the EN, Naruto didn't care about it for now, and has simply decided to let them kill each other, and will only interfere if he can, and absolutely needs to. There was one more thing they talked about. When Naruto mentioned during the talk, how the Uzumaki clan got the dragon contract, and about Uzumaki Shanks, Simon decided to inform Naruto and the others, of who Fuka really is. Fuka wasn't in the meeting, as Naruto didn't think she was necessary, but Simon is, as Naruto knew he was very strong, and needed him to fight against the dragons. It turns out that Fuka is actually about 700 years old, and she is the daughter of Uzumaki Shanks. Younger daughter, as Shanks had a son, who was a firstborn, and Naruto is descendant of that son. Fuka, though, she never married, until she met Simon, and has lived a life in seclusion. The reason she was so old, and is still alive, is because she was born with a special bloodline, which made her stop aging once she reached her prime. 
She was the only person to ever be born with that bloodline, and is unique to her. No one before or after her, had it. Technically speaking, Fuka is not completely immortal, as almost nothing in the existence, truly is, but she is ageless, which means that she won't age and die of old age, but she can be killed. Her partially immortality also extends to the illnesses, which means that she also can't get sick and die that way. Truly, the only way for Fuka to die, is to be killed. Of course, when someone has lived for that long, they learn few things and become really powerful, so killing her, wouldn't be easy for anyone, and would be impossible for any regular mortal. Because of her immortality, Fuka has always lived in seclusion, as she knew that whatever friends she made, they will age and die, and she will be left behind, all alone and with broken heart. That's also the reason she never married, and didn't have children. That all changed when she met Simon, few decades ago, and they both found out that they are not regular humans, and that they are both partly immortal. Fuka, because of her bloodline, and Simon, because he is not a human, and is part of a clan, whose members can live for several millennia. They have both lived lonely lives, and have gotten used to it through the centuries, but when they met, the sparks flew, and they fell for each other, and have eventually gotten together, and sometime later, Yoko was born. Of course, they still continued to live in relative seclusion, and were content, not to let anyone know what they are and what they do. It's partly because of the desire to stay hidden from the rest of the world, that they didn't do anything during the siege on the Whirlpool country, which led to its fall. So technically speaking, the two of them are partially at fault for the fall of once great country. The reason Simon brought this up right now, is because at one time, Fuka told him about a special sealing barrier her father left in her possession, as he thought that it would be a crime, if such a barrier would be lost to time. He also though that, one day, the world might need that Fuinjutsu formula, and since Fuka is immortal, she was a perfect guardian for it. Naruto realized what Fuinjutsu formula, Simon was talking about, and has decided to speak with Fuka about it, and see if it's usable by any of them, as he is not on the same level in Fuinjutsu as Shanks was, but, now that he knows that Fuka is Shanks' daughter, and is 700 years old, she might be as good as Shanks was, and she might be able to use the barrier and seal the dragons, in case it's needed, if Naruto and his blood clones, can't kill them. With the plans for the war decided, Naruto left to inform the dragon clan of his decision, before he will go and inform his blood clones of the plan, and the upcoming fight they will be in. He left to Yeloporo, to talk with Fuka about the barrier, and if she can perform it, or not. XXX. While Naruto and the others were making plans for the war, Jiraiya was having the time of his life. Conan has introduced him to Gurren, and the three of them have ended up drinking like crazy, to the point that Conan and Gurren have passed out on the floor, while Jiraiya was barely standing. While he was barely standing, Jiraiya's mind was still very sharp, and he couldn't help but notice that Conan and Gurren have liberated themselves of most of their clothings, while they were all drinking, leaving the two women in just a pair of underwear, and nothing else. Jiraiya knew that they would have never done that if they were not drunk, but since they were drunk, they didn't care if they were almost completely gnarled in front of a pervert like Jiraiya. This has led to Jiraiya making a decision, which will completely change his future, and not in a way that he thought. XXX. The night after Naruto left to talk with the dragons and then with his blood clones, someone has arrived in the new whirlpool. She was weak, dirty, covered in dried blood, and was barely standing on her legs, but she was able to reach the village. The news she was carrying, though, were not good. Not good at all. When Naruto returned the next day, and walked into Sieloporo's office, he was met by his blood clone, along with several other hybrids, some of which, were Tyuya and Taya. Naruto took one look at them all, and realized that something was wrong. The looks on their faces told him that. What happened? Naruto asked with dread. Nothing was coming to his mind. He couldn't think of a single thing that could happen in a single night he was gone from the new whirlpool. The others looked at each other, before Taiya sighed, and spoke. Someone showed up here last night, Naruto rose his eyebrows at that, as no one knows of the new whirlpool, so they shouldn't have the reason to get to the island. It also made him wonder, who that was, and what have they done, to cause such a reaction from his friends. She was wounded, and had dirt, and dried blood all over her body. But even like that, she was able to run here all the way from the leaf village to tell us about what happened there. Naruto suddenly narrowed his eyes, and thought of Hanata. She was probably the only female in the leaf he could think about at that moment, and probably the only one he cares about in that place.
He prayed that nothing has happened to her. He was out of luck, though. Who was it? Naruto asked. It was Hanabi Huga, Tayuya said, making Naruto narrow his eyes more, as he thought of the name, and where he knows it from. She is Hanata's younger sister. Naruto's eyes flew wide open for a second, before they went back to being narrowed, as he was now glaring at everyone in the room, making them all, except Sielaporo, start to sweat. What happened? Naruto growled out, but he had a feeling that something bad has happened to Hanata, and if it did, then he has failed to protect her, like he said he will, as he knew that she loves him, and is on his side. Tayuya sighed again, and then went on and explained everything that happened in the Hyuga clan compound, the night before last, and how it all ended in the end. By the time she finished explaining, she was looking at Naruto, with fear in her eyes, just like everyone else. Naruto was so angry, that he was releasing Black Rarioku, and was looking more like a demon, than a human, or even a hollow. The whole office, along with the rest of the island, started to shake from Naruto's power, and everyone on the island were able to feel it. They are all scared, as they are wondering, what is happening, to cause Naruto to release his power like this. H. Hanata has B. Bean, Naruto stuttered. Yes she is, she is. Naruto grew even angrier, before in a burst of speed, he flew through the office door, and out of the building, before he proceeded to fly away from the village, at the speed unmatched by anyone in the world. There was a sonic boom, as he broke the sound barrier, and the whole end was shaking from his power. Everyone in the EN, could feel the release of power, and the earthquake, and they all agreed that it's much worse, than what happened few weeks ago, when Naruto released his powers for the first time. As Naruto was flying toward the leaf village, his eyes glowed red for a few seconds, before they returned to normal. Unknown to him, at that same moment, the eyes of all of his blood clones, glowed red, before they all returned to normal. None of them will know the meaning of this, for a little while longer. XXX. Conan slowly opened her eyes. She rubbed them a little, to take away the sleep from them, before she started to focus on what happened, and where she is. She remembers that she was with Jiraiya and Gurren last night, and that they were drinking. She then started to remember how drunk she got, and then, much to her horror and embarrassment, she remembered that both she and Gurren have taken off the clothes while in front of a pervert like Jiraiya. Conan shivered, thinking of an eyeful she and her friend must have given to Jiraiya. She then tried to remember what happened after, but everything was blurry. Conan looked around the room, and saw that she was in her own room, lying on her bed, with Gurren lying with her head on top of Conan's breasts, which were exposed, and she was gnarled, just like Gurren was. Conan's eyes flew wide open, as she realized that she and Gurren were gnarled as the day they were born, and were lying in the same bed. She then looked around, and saw something that made her heart stop for a few moments. Jiraiya was also there, at the bottom of the bad, lying on his back completely gnarled, and with his six-inch, soft eye, exposed to Conan's eyes. Conan couldn't help but cast a look at Jiraiya's die in his body, before she blushed. Jiraiya might be in his fifties, but he still is a man with a great body, and Conan will admit to herself, with a nicely sized die. Then, everything that happened last night, hit Conan like a freight train. Memories of her passing out came first, before she then remembered waking up at some point, with Gurren lying on top of her, and Jiraiya behind Gurren, fucking her. Then, Conan remembered how, instead of sending Jiraiya straight to hell, for what he was doing to her and her friend, she actually started to enjoy it, and thus, started a few hours of debauchery, where both herself and Gurren, who also awake at one point, were fucked raw by Jiraiya's eight-inch long die. Conan's face turned bright red, both in embarrassment and anger, before she shouted. Wake up. Gurren and Jiraiya woke up instantly, with Jiraiya jumping from his sleep, and falling from the bed as he was lying close to the edge. That got him fresh right away, while Gurren had to rub the sleep from her face. Gurren and Jiraiya looked at where they were, and their state of undress, before they both remembered what happened last night. Jiraiya, as soon as he remembered last night, gained a huge grin on his face, while his die actually twitched a little from the images in his head. Gurren though, blushed scarlet, and used the sheet to cover her nard body, just like Conan was currently doing. The two of them then looked at Jiraiya with anger in their eyes. You better have a damn good explanation for what you've done last night, Jiraiya. Conan growled, with her eyes glowing in anger, making Jiraiya lose his smirk, which was replaced by the look of dread. And if you don't, well, I hope you enjoyed last night, because that would be the last time you ever had Shay. 
I will personally make sure of that. Jiraiya paled so white, that Conan and Gura know that he died, and became a ghost. After a minute, Jiraiya managed to regain some color, before he coughed and held his arms in the air, as if he was surrendering himself. Now girls, there is no need to make hasty decisions, he said, making both women growl at him, and making Jiraiya flinch. I simply did what nearly any other male would have done in my situation. Besides, the two of you didn't seem to have been against it, if I remember correctly. There was a smirk on his face, when he said that. Both women scowled at Jiraiya and looked ready to tear him a new one. We were drunk, you imbecile, Gurren growled. How could you have used us in that way, while we were intoxicated? I'm sorry, Jiraiya apologized, and much to the surprise of Conan and Gurren, he seems to really be sorry. But the two of you were partly at fault here. I mean, you took off your cloths, and stayed only in your underwear. When I saw you like that, all passed out from too much drinking, I just couldn't stop myself. I had to have you both, or I would have hated myself for the rest of my life, for missing such an opportunity. You can hate me for that, but that's how it is, and there is nothing we can do to change what already happened. The two women growled once again, and were about to say something, but they were interrupted by a feeling of dread, which washed over them for a moment, before the whole place started to shake. All three instantly knew what the cause of this is. What they didn't know, is the reason for Naruto's anger. All three jumped from where they were, and went to get dressed, so they can go and see what's happening. While he was dressing, Jiraiya thought that he is safe, and that he will keep his balls intact, Conan and Gurren made a mental note, to deal with Jiraiya later. They have more important business to attend to right now. XXX. The end was shaking like a leaf in the middle of a tornado. Naruto's rage was such that his powers feel even higher than when he first released them against Kaido, and when Sayeloporo released them against Tobi. As such, everyone around the end were trying to protect themselves from the destruction, and are all wondering, what the hell is going on? XXX. On the Dragon Island, Bahamut and the other traitor dragons, were feeling Naruto's rage, and are wondering what made him snap so much. They are also wondering, how he can be so powerful, to the point that his power is so close to the level of the Elder Dragon Gods. For the first time since he decided to release the Elder Dragon Gods, and go after Naruto, Bahamut wondered if even the Elders can take on Naruto, especially since Naruto is not alone, and has blood clones, who are just as powerful as he is. They might be able to overpower the Elders with numbers, instead of power. XXX. Naruto's blood clones were just as surprised as everyone else in the Rien, as they can't imagine what could happen to set the original off like this. They talked with him just last night, and there was nothing that was telling them that there might be a problem of some kind. But apparently, something happened, and sent Naruto into a blind rage. The blood clones wondered, what will happen now, and how will this affect the incoming war? XXX. After a night of terror, the next morning in the Leaf Village was one of a complete lockdown, as Kakashi has declared a state of emergency, and locked the entire village, as soon as the word got out of what happened in the Huga compound. Ninja from the village were running around like headless chickens, trying to figure out what happened in the Huga compound, as there were no survivors left there, except small children, who didn't know anything. Over a hundred corpses were carried from the compound, and into the village morgue. The ninja who had to do that job, were barely able to do it, as there was so much blood and gore all over the place, that it was sickening. It also took them a while, because they had to pick body parts from all over the place, and then the medics in the morgue had to spend a lot of time, trying to reassemble the bodies, as best they could, so that they can try and figure out, what happened and who killed them all. By the time the night came, and the preliminary results were handed to the hockage, he read that the conclusion of the investigation is that, the Hugo clan members, for an unknown reason, killed each other in the most gruesome way. One thing that they found weird, is that all but two members of the Huga clan, had their entire chakra network completely fried and destroyed. While the ninja were running around, the civilians were all locked up in their houses, and forbidden to come out, until the situation was resolved. As such, they had no idea what happened, but they can guess that it must be something terrible, if they were locked up like this, which is something that has never happened, even in the times of war, and even when the Uchiha clan was killed off in a single night. The next morning, the Leaf Council was in the meeting, with the Hokage and the two elders. They were talking about what happened the night before last night, and how is this going to affect the future of the village, that is, if the village even has the future, 
considering the upcoming war against the Akatsuki, the threat of the other hidden villages, as well as the threat of Naruto. From the preliminary reports we've seen, it would seem that every member of the Hyuga clan, from the academy agent up, have been killed, Homura, one of the village elders, spoke. The only ones left alive, are the children below the academy age, as well as newborn babies. That leaves the Hyuga clan with just about a dozen members left, and they are all pretty much useless for now, since they are so young. Kakashi sighed. He never wanted to become a hockage, but had to in the end, as there was no one else capable to do the job. And now, just after he was named a hockage, he had to prepare the people for the war. And if that wasn't enough, the Hyuga clan is all but completely exterminated. Kakashi wondered, what's going to happen next, and if something does happen, he is sure that it would be the worst thing so far. The medical ninja have gone over all the corpses of the Hyuga clan, and there are two things which they found, that might shed some light on what happened, Koharu, the second village elders, spoke. Her words, caused everyone to look at her. She continued. All but three members of the clan were dressed in their sleeping wear, meaning that they were sleeping, at the time, whatever happened has started. The three who weren't dressed in their sleeping cloths, were all nard. Those three were, Hanata Huga, Neji Huga and Hassan Huga. Neji was found dead at the floor in the room which belonged to Hanata. He had a hole in his chest, and his heart was missing. It was as if it was ripped out. Hassan and Hanata were found along with the other members of the clan, and they all had wounds from the battle, and were covered in blood. Except Hanata, and Neji, all the others, had their chakra network fried, and in some cases, blow up. Of them all, Hanata was the most damaged, and had the most blood on her. The medical ninja have also performed a checkup on Hanata, and were able to determine that she was raped. As soon as those words left Koharu's mouth, there was a sharp intake of breath from everyone in the room. They all also went wide-eyed at that piece of information. The checkup of Hanata Huga has also determined that there was a change in her chakra, and her eyes, Koharu continued to speak. Her chakra coils seemed bigger than anything else the medics have ever seen, and her chakra had a very dark feel to it. Then there are her eyes. Instead of a regular Byakugan, Hanata's eyes were completely red, and the veins around her eyes, which show up every time a Byakugan is activated, were red as well. Another thing very interesting is that, even though she was dead, Hanata's eyes were still activated, and didn't deactivate upon her death, like they did to the other members of the Huga clan. Upon the completion of the preliminary investigation, and from what the medical ninja have told us, the conclusion we came upon is that, Hanata Huga has been raped by Hassan and Neji Huga, and this has set her of in some way that she went and attacked the rest of the clan. The questions remain though, why was Hanata raped by her own grandfather and cousin? What happened to her eyes? And finally, how was she able to take on the whole Huga clan by herself, and kill them all, even if she died from the wounds inflicted on her? There were murmurs around the council room, with everyone except the elders and Kakashi, talking to one another, trying to figure out, what happened, and why. They also tried to figure out the answers to Koharu's questions. Unfortunately, they weren't coming up with anything. There is another thing we need to figure out, Homura spoke once again, gaining everyone's attention. Among the corpses, we found all members of the Huga clan, from the academy age, and up, except, for one. We didn't find any clue of Hanabi Huga. She wasn't among the corpses, nor was there a body part unaccounted for. This means that, either Hanabi has been able to escape from the massacre, and is hiding somewhere in the village, or, she was able to escape and has left the village, and run off somewhere. Regardless of what it is, we need to find her, as she is currently the oldest member of the Huga clan left, and thus, is the only one who can take on as the head of the clan, as well as be used for missions. The other kids are not even close to be battle ready. I have known Hanata Huga for years, Sum Inazuka spoke. She was in the team with my son, and I have met the girl many times, before and after she changed. While I will admit that she has changed a lot after Naruto's death, everyone winced at the mention of Naruto's name, some because they feel guilty of what happened to him, and some because they remember what he has become and the amount of death and destruction he can cause. The one thing that the changed Hanata had with her old self, is her love for her sister. Hanata Huga, no matter how much she changes, or how much she snaps, she would never hurt her sister. Thus, I believe that Hanabi didn't just escape because she wanted to, or could, but because Hanata told her to run away, and allowed her to do it, by preventing the others to stop Hanabi. 
Everyone in the room thought about Soom's words, and soon they realized that, she was actually right. Hanata's love and care for her younger sister is well known, and as such, it wouldn't be much of a stretch to say that she let her escape from the other members of the Huga clan. This of course, brings another question. Why would Hanabi have to run away, and not just stay back? Hanata, if she didn't want to hurt her sister, she didn't have to, but Hanabi didn't have to escape as well. Unless of course, Hanata and Hanabi thought that Hanabi didn't have a future in the Leaf Village, and have decided to try her luck on some other place. Another question is, where? Before anything else could be said, and questions asked, the Leaf Village started to shake, in the same way as just few weeks before, perhaps, even more than back then. Before anyone could do anything, or even try to run away, the explosion shocked the building in which the meeting was being held, and in the next moment, everyone in the room saw the devil himself, standing in front of them, looking mad as all hell. Naruto was once again in his true form, though this time, he was looking more buff and mature. His eyes were also glowing with bright crimson color, and there were cracks all over his body and face. It looked like his body is the ground itself, which has trenches all over it, and at the bottom of those trenches, lava was flowing. All in all, at that moment, Naruto looked like something which could only come from the lowest pits of hell, and he was so angry, that for the first time since he returned to the Ien, his personality and powers, which were Yamiago, were coming to the surface. Where is Hanata? Naruto asked in a powerful voice, before he roared, once again. Where is she? The roar was so powerful that the sound waves alone destroyed everything that was left standing after the earthquake. The members of the Leaf Council stared at the face of the devil, with fear leaking of off them like a sweat. Some of the members, mostly civilians, even soiled themselves from the fear they were feeling at that moment. As for the Shinobi Council, the Elders and Kakashi, they were simply wondering how anyone could be this powerful and will they manage to survive this time, or is this the end of the Leaf Village? In Naruto, Kakashi managed to call, drawing Naruto's eyes on him. He gulped before he steeled his nerves, and said, In Naruto, Hanata is D dead. Naruto's anger rose even more, and with it, his power increased once again. At that moment, Naruto's power level was such that he has most likely covered the difference he has with the elder dragon gods, making his power, equal to theirs. Too bad that his power-up isn't permanent, and is depending on his rage. I know she is dead, you miserable waste of space, Naruto said in a demonic voice. I want to know, where her body is. BBB but, WY, Kakashi managed to ask, even though he couldn't even lift his head from the ground, from the amount of pressure he was under. The others in the room are mostly passed out, the shinobi council and the elders, or dead, the civilian council. The civilians simply couldn't handle the pressure released from Naruto's newest power up. Why D do you W wish to SC her corpse? I have my reasons, Naruto spoke. Now, tell me, or I will find her myself, but while doing that, I will kill every single male, woman and child I come across during my search. Kakashi nearly had a heart attack, when he heard Naruto's threat. Seeing Naruto like this, and knowing how much Naruto hates the Leaf Village and the people in it, Kakashi had no doubt that Naruto would really go and kill all those people. As such, Kakashi made a wise decision, and told Naruto where Hanata's corpse is. Naruto looked at Kakashi with narrowed eyes for a few seconds, before he simply vanished in a burst of speed, which was pretty much equal to the flying thunder god Jutsu. Kakashi couldn't handle it any longer, and he passed out in the middle of the destroyed council room. XXX. Naruto arrives at the Leaf Morgue, where all the corpses of the Hyuga clan members, were currently located. Once he got there, he was angry as all hell, and his anger just kept increasing, but the moment he entered into the morgue, and saw what's inside, his face split in a demonic grin, which scared the hell out of everyone who was currently in the morgue. Those who were in the morgue were the dead bodies of the Hyuga clan members, along with the souls of quite a few of those members. They were just floating there in the room, and are all currently looking at Naruto, who was standing at the entrance looking at them as well. Even though he was grinning like a devil, none of Naruto's anger has disappeared, when he saw the souls of the Hyuga clan members. In fact, his anger only increased, though one couldn't tell that by the look on his face, but instead, by the increased pressure which consumed the room, and destroyed everything which already wasn't destroyed. Even the souls were affected by Naruto's spiritual pressure, much to their shock, as they never thought that anything mortal would be able to affect them, now that they are dead. It hurts, doesn't it? Naruto questioned, while looking at several dozen souls of the Hyuga clan members. 
they were all looking at him in shock, as they didn't think he would be able to see them. Naruto looked at them all, and first he noticed that they are all either middle-aged, or elderly people. There were barely any young Hyuga, and none of the academy children, which were killed by Hanata. The next thing he noticed was, that Hanata's soul wasn't among her clansmen, which increased Naruto's anger even more. By then, his anger is such that his, senescencia, is coming to effect, and the black and purple miasma is eviscerating everything in its path, from the tables, to the chairs, walls, and even the corpses of the Hyuga clan members. The only thing not affected, was the souls of the Hyuga, as well as Hanata's body, which Naruto can see in the distance, as his eyesight is good enough to read her name of the name tag attached to Hanata's toe, which isn't covered by the sheet. And yet, Naruto spoke again, the pain you feel right now, is nothing compared to the pain you people have put Hanata through her whole life, and especially in the end of it. W what do you t think you are doing, why you, d demon. The soul of Hassan Hyuga stuttered out, while not even able to lift his head from the floor, just like the rest of the Hugas. Naruto looked at the Hyuga elder, and Hanata's grandfather, as well as the men who raped her, and started the whole Hyuga massacre. Naruto didn't know that, though, as he never met Hassan Hyuga. And who are you, to call me, a demon? Naruto shot back. I am, H. Hassan Hyuga, the old man said. I am the F former head of the H. Hyuga clan. Naruto's eyes narrowed. So you are Hanata's grandfather. Naruto stated, instead of asking. He was pretty sure in his guess. That demonic bitch is no granddaughter of mine, Hassan growled, lifting his head, just a tiny bit, before his face hit the floor, once again, as soon as he dared insult Hanata. Naruto has simply increased his power output, and pressured the Hyuga souls, even more. Just look at what she did to us. You should have seen what she has become, before she died along with us. That abomination shouldn't have ever existed. Naruto snapped, before teleported in front of Hassan, and then grabbed him by the back of his head, and lifted him off the ground. Naruto enjoyed the look of pain and screams, which were coming from Hassan's mouths, as he was putting pressure on the old Hyuga's head. The only abominations in this room, are you and Neji, Naruto growled, his voice becoming demonic. You raped your own granddaughter, and threatened to rape the other as well. That's the reason Hanata snapped, and turned into, whatever that thing was. If it wasn't for you and Neji, none of this would have happened, so if you want to blame someone, blame yourself. The other Hyuga in the room looked at Naruto with fear on their faces, but they also looked at Hassan with hate, as they knew that Naruto was right, and that Hassan and Neji are the ones at fault for what happened two nights ago. They are the ones who caused the Hyuga clan destruction and left it with only about a dozen members, all of which are small kids, and babies. Naruto looked at Hassan for a few more moments, before he smirked. A smirk, which scared the hell out of everyone in the room. You know, I thought about sending you all to hell, to suffer for the rest of eternity, everyone flinched at the threat, and none doubted that Naruto could actually do that, but now, I have a better idea. You will not suffer, but you will also not get a chance for a rebirth or reincarnation, as all those who die have a chance for, regardless if they go to hell or soul society. You on the other hand, you will simply cease to exist. Your power, will become mine, and everything that you once were, will disappear. Naruto then opened his mouth, right in front of Hassan, and sucked in the air. Unfortunately for Hassan, Naruto didn't only suck in the air, but also Hassan as well. Soon enough, Hassan's soul disappeared. It was eaten by Naruto, who was now standing there, with his face looking downward, and with his eyes closed. Everyone else in the room watched wide-eyed, as Naruto literally ate, Hassan's soul. They were now afraid that he would do the same to them. At that moment, the souls of the deceased Hyuga clan members wondered if it might be better to go to hell, and not be eaten by Naruto. If they go to hell, they would at least have an idea of what awaits them, but if they are eaten by Naruto, they have a feeling that they wouldn't like it. Naruto's face split into a grin, before he opened his eyes, and looked at the scared and shocked faces of the Hyuga clan members. Naruto was seating on the hill outside of the new Whirlpool village. He was looking down at the people, as well as his village, which by now was almost completely built, and the only thing left of the palace, Grand Market, as well as some finishing touches on the harbour. It's been a week, since Naruto went to the Leaf Village, after he found out what happened to Hanata. That day, Naruto was enraged like never before, and his rage, has led him to eat the souls of all the dead Hyuga, whose souls haven't left to the afterlife, and have stayed behind. 
That day, after he ate Hassan's soul, Naruto has awakened Byakugan, after which he ate the souls of several dozen members of the Hyuga clan, including Neji and Hyashi Hyugas. Curious thing happened after Naruto ate all those souls. For the next two days, Naruto was experiencing pain and burning sensation in his eyes, before on the third day, it finally stopped. Naruto found out soon enough, why the pain happened, though he is not sure of what happened, and why. Once the souls of all the Hyuga were eaten, Naruto went to Hanata's body, and apologized to her for failing to protect her. He then sealed her body into a sealing scroll, and left the destroyed morgue, which, at that point was just a pile of rubble with no bodies left inside. Naruto then went back to the Leaf Council room, or what's left of it, anyway, and then proceeded to wake Kakashi up, by slugging him in the face. Kakashi woke up instantly. Naruto demanded from Kakashi to tell him where the surviving kids from the Hyuga clan were, and while Kakashi didn't want to tell him that, he had no balls to challenge Naruto, as he knew that Naruto would kill him if he does, and what's even worse, he will kill many others in the Leaf Village, while searching for those kids, just like he said he will, if Kakashi didn't tell him where Hanata's body was. In the end, Naruto made few shadow clones, and had them take the children from the orphanage to the new whirlpool. Naruto went with them, leaving behind semi-destroyed Leaf Village, as well as passed out or dead members of the Leaf Council. When he arrived in the new whirlpool, along with a dozen shadow clone, each carrying a child, he was met by all of his close friends, and allies, from Taiya, who was his first friend, all the way to Jiraiya, who has arrived just few days prior. In the meeting which followed, he told them that Hanata is dead, and since her soul is gone, he can't revive her. He then said that he ate the souls of the Hyuga, which have stayed behind, and how he has the Byakugan, as well as all of their knowledge. In the end, Hanabi was explained everything, and she cried herself to sleep that day, as she couldn't believe what happened just because of her desire to find out if her sister loves her. Hanabi will most likely blame herself until the end of her days, for the rape of Hanata, as well as the death of almost her entire clan, and most importantly, Hanata's deaths. Since Hanabi is just 12 years old, and is unable to take care of the children, the Hyuga kids were placed in an orphanage, which was built in a single day, to house them all. Gurren, Sunid and Sakura expressed desire to take care of the children in the orphanage, and Naruto allowed them to. Naturally, since Hanabi is the only Hyuga left who can teach those children, she will be paying them a visit nearly every day, to be with them, and to teach them of their clan, as well as their clan Taijutsu. Seven days ago, Naruto stormed into the Leaf Village, and in the end, got half of what he wanted. He wanted revenge, and he got it, by eating the souls of the dead Hyuga, thus denying him the afterlife, and a chance for the rebirth. He also wanted to revive Hanata, but unfortunately, that is something he didn't get, though he vowed to find a way to revive her, and no, he wasn't going to use reanimation jutsu to do it. He will find another way to do it, if it's the last thing he ever does. Then five days later, which was two days ago, the fourth shinobi world war, has officially started, with the shinobi from the allied nations, taking on the Akatsuki, led by Tobi and several of their surviving members, including Sako, who was still undercover. The Akatsuki were backed up by 100,000 white zetsus, along with an army of the revived ninja, from all nations. Today, is the third day of the war, and while Naruto and the new whirlpool haven't done anything in the war so far, as it's not their problem, they knew that tonight, or tomorrow at the latest, the traitor dragons will make their move, and thus, the true war between the new whirlpool and the dragons, will commence. When it comes to how the current war is going, there are many casualties on the side of the allied nations. They are doing as best they can, but their problem is that they are overwhelmed by the sheer number of the white zetsu, along with the revived ninja, which are already dead, and as such, hard to deal with. For every reanimated ninja being taken out, Allied forces lose two to three shinobi, and when you add zetsus into the mix, as well as the remaining members of the Akatsuki, mainly Kisum and Sasuke, who are in the front line, and are killing everyone they come across, well, it's enough to say that the Allied nations are in deep shit. While Naruto doesn't necessarily care about any of the people who are currently in the war, from any of the nations, he knows that many are innocent people, and they are wasting their lives, for nothing. Still, he doesn't care much, as he understands that they chose to go to war, and what happens to them, is not his problem. Then again, he has many of his friends, who are not happy with so many people losing their lives. They want to help the allied nations and deal with the Akatsuki, 
But while Naruto wouldn't forbid them from interfering with the war, they know that what's happening now, is nothing compared to what will happen once the traitor dragons come out, joined by the elder dragon gods. That, will start the true war and the destruction, unlike anything seen before. Naruto and his friends know that no matter how many people die in the war between the Akatsuki and the allied nations, it's nothing, compared to the amount of death and destruction, which will happen because of the elder dragon gods. They are capable of exterminating all life in the EN, and as such, are a threat on a world level, and only Naruto, his blood clones and his friends, can stop them. As such, as much as it pains them to just sit back and not do anything, Naruto's friends don't have any other choice. They had to choose, and they chose to fight the battle against the greater evil, and leave the lesser evil to do what it wants. Naruto has, of course, been watching carefully on the current war, between the five great nations, and the Akatsuki, so that he can know what's happening, and what the end result will be. One of the things he noticed, is that that the five great nations, are seriously lacking in the amount of shinobi they have. Now, that can be explained with the fact that the water country has been in a civil war for a long time, and has lost many of their shinobi, which is why they are not in full power. As for the other four, they were in a war against each other, with the slight exception of the wind country, but the wind has always been the weakest of the five, and didn't have too many shinobi. Even then, with all the wars that the Great Five have been in lately, and all the problems that they've had, they should still have more shinobi than they've brought to a war against the Akatsuki. Naruto has been trying to find the reason, as to why that is the case, and what he found, he didn't like. It would seem that the Leaf has lost many of their combat-ready, shinobi, with the destruction of the Hyuga clan. But, it turns out that, the other four nations have lost several of their clans, practically overnight. In their case though, they didn't die out, like the Hyuga. They simply up and abandoned their villages, just like Naruto learned from Hanabi, that the Hyuga clan was planning. It didn't take to be a genius to realize that this is all connected, and the same beings who have approached the Hyuga clan, have also approached the other clans in the other villages. Naruto isn't 100% sure, but he can guess that the ones who have approached those clans, and coerced them into abandoning their own villages to join up with them, are none others than the traitor dragons. Naruto had no idea why the dragons went and made all those clans join them, as he is sure that they are not fond of humans, and wouldn't want to work with them, but he is sure that, regardless of the reason, the dragons have suddenly gotten a huge boost in the power, and while those shinobi are not a huge threat to him and his friends, they can be a nuisance to deal with, when you add the fact that Naruto and the others, will have to deal with dragons. Naruto has been seating on that rock, outside of the new whirlpool, for hours. He was thinking of everything that has happened in the war so far, and was thinking of what's to happen next. He is also planning on what to do, once the war is over, and the dragons have been dealt with. He was thinking of a nice way to take over the end from the ones who are left alive in the war, as he sees no point in killing them, but isn't willing to go easy on them either, if they try something. As he was seating there, Naruto suddenly felt a shift in the air, and once he looked around, he immediately saw that the full moon is out, but instead of being white, it was red, with the markings of some kind of Sharingan eye, being projected from its surface. Naruto saw this, and sighed. It seems that the Tobi and Zetsu got what they wanted. He then disappeared from the rock he was seating on, and went down to the village. He saw right away that every living being in the village, from humans to animals, had Rinnegan eye, and are in some form of a trance. He knew right away, that they are trapped in the infinite Tsukuyomi, that Sako informed him of. He then watched as the tree roots came out from the ground, and all those who were trapped in the genjutsu, were trapped by the trees, and wrapped inside like a birthday present. Naruto wasn't happy with this, not only because his people are in danger now, but also because his village has been damaged slightly by the roots. Naruto then went to Sieloporo's office, and there he saw all of his closest friends, already assembled for a meeting. The only ones not there, are those who haven't been made full hollows, or hybrids, as well as Sako, who was still working undercover for the Akatsuki. What now? Tayuya asked the question, as soon as Naruto stepped into the room. You wanted to wait and see if Tobi and Zetsu will pull what they want to achieve, and it seems that they did. Now every living being in the EN, except us, and the dragons, are trapped inside of the Genjutsu. Naruto sighed. Sako is there, and she is not affected by this, just like we aren't, Naruto said. I'm sure she can deal with this. Our main concern still are the dragons, which are most definitely going to come out tonight. What makes you so sure? Sunad asked. 
I just have a feeling, Naruto shrugged. Also, I think that they will want to use this situation, when everyone is trapped inside the Genjutsu, so that we wouldn't be getting any help from anyone, even if the chances for someone helping us, were very low. So, we wait, Taya questioned, and Naruto nodded. Yes, Naruto said, but you better be ready. The shit can start any minute, and we can't waste any time. We need to deal with the Elder Dragons as soon as possible. Where are your other blood clones? Sakura asked. They are ready, and will join us as soon as the dragons attack, Naruto replied. The same goes for the Great Red, and the others from the summoning clan. I just have to summon them. Won't you lose a lot of your power, just to summon them? Sunad asked, as she knows how taxing on the chakra can the summoning be. Naruto shook his head. No, he said, I will only summon the Great Red, and one other dragon. That other dragon won't battle at all, and will only be there to summon the others, who will battle. After that, he will return to the mount. Look out. That way, I won't use too much power to summon them all. How will this other dragon have so much power, to summon other dragons? Tayuya asked. The summons can summon each other anywhere, without using any power at all, Sunid replied. She knew this because of her own summons. It's actually a very good idea, to summon them all like that. It is, Naruto confirmed, and then he sat down on the chair, and waited for the inevitable. XXX. During the last two days, ever since the war started, Sako has always been in the middle of the big battles, but hasn't actually battled anyone. She was just standing there, watching and doing nothing. When asked why she wasn't battling, and helping the war efforts, she said that it's beneath her to fight against people who stand no chance. She likes a challenge, and she won't get that in this war. After that, she was left alone by both Tobi and Zetsu. Kisum and Sasuke didn't care, and Kabuto was in some cave, from where he is sending the reanimated shinobi to the battlefield. All this time, Sako watched as the tides of war changed, from one side to the other. At first, the allied shinobi fought hard and bravely, as they had an advantage over white zetsu, as they are more skillful. Then, the white zetsus revealed their special ability, to absorb someone's chakra, and transform into that person. This has changed the war in favor of the Akatsuki, who pushed even harder, by adding the reanimated ninja. The allied nations, pushed even harder after that, and fought almost to the last man, just to even the tides, and for about a day, they were successful. Then, Toby showed up bringing the tailed beasts with him, and any chances the allied nations had, evaporated into thin air. Toby was eventually able to revive the ten tails, and used it to absorb as much chakra from the other shinobi, as he could, so that the ten tails, would reach its true form. He even added the nine tails chakra, by feeding the ten tails, gold and silver brothers, along with the revived and controlled fourth hockage. The fourth was followed by the other cage who were revived. The reason they were fed to the ten tails, is because they have chakra, even though they are just reanimated corpses, and as such, their high amount of chakra, would help the ten tails, reach its final form, sooner than it normally would. Sako could only sit back and watch as the allied shinobi were decimated, by the ten tails, Tobi, and the rest of the Akatsuki. Even the five cage, were no match against the power of the ten tails, even if they could take on the members of the Akatsuki. But, the ten tails is simply a mountain, which none of them could climb over. By that point, it looked like the Akatsuki has won, and there is nothing that can be done to stop them, unless of course, Naruto decides to do something. But then, just as Tobi was about to make himself ten-tailed Jinchuriki, Kabuto played his card, and revealed that he was never on Tobi's side, and was only putting up with his demands, as he was waiting for the right chance to strike. What Kabuto has done though, surprised even Sako. Kabuto went and managed to find the corpse of Madara Uchiha, and revived him. He was planning to use Madara to kill all of the Akatsuki, and then with no to oppose him, he, Kabuto, would become the ten-tailed Jinchuriki, and rule the En, as he sees fit. Unfortunately for Kabuto, he underestimated Madara's power and skills, and didn't think that Madara would be able to break Kabuto's control over himself, and free himself from Kabuto's influence, thus, being able to do what he wants, and not what Kabuto wants. It didn't take long to Madara, to beat Tobi, as soon as he found out that Tobi, had no intention of reviving him, as they agreed long ago, and instead, planned to become ten-tailed Jinchuriki himself, and cast the infinite Tsukuyomi. Kisum and Sasuke stood at Tobi's side, as they knew him, sort of. 
but they didn't know Madara, or what his intention were. Zetsu though, stood at Madara's side, as he saw this as a chance to accomplish his goal, and free Kaguya, which is what he planned to do all along, but with Tobi, instead of Madara, ever since he found out that Tobi, doesn't plan to revive Madara, and instead plans to make himself ten tails Jinchuriki. Fortunately for Black Zetsu, Kabuto has done the job he wasn't expecting him to, and revived Madara, giving Black Zetsu, a perfect vessel for Kaguya to take over and revive herself. Madara defeated Tobi, Kisum and Sasuke, very easily and without any problems, proving himself to them that he is the strongest, at least that's what Madara thinks, as he doesn't know about Naruto and his company. When it comes to Sako, she still just stood on the side, and did nothing, even when Madara was revived, and defeated Tobi, Sasuke and Kisum, while Black Zetsu joined Madara. She waited all the way until Madara controlled Tobi to revive him, and then made himself the Ten Tails Jinchuriki, to finally act. And act she did. Sako attacked Madara, and in front of all the survivors, both from the Akatsuki, and from the allied Shinobi, she battled against Ten Tailed Jinchuriki, Madara, on an equal ground, and even actually had a little advantage, due to her speed being something Madara simply didn't have a way to deal with. Watching the battle, everyone, starting from Madara, all the way to the weak and defeated shinobi from the allied Naruto, were shocked to see that there is someone who can match Madara's power, after, he made himself ten-tailed Jinchuriki, especially since the five cage all failed, along with Tobi, Sasuke and Kisum. At one point, after being beaten well, Madara grew angry, and started causing widespread destruction, and killed many shinobi, by doing that. He did this, thinking that, Sako might grow angry at the death of innocent people, and make a mistake, but he was wrong. Sako didn't really give two shits about any of them, but she did decided to show a little bit more to Madara, and bury him into the ground. Sako did exactly that. She released all of her power, which dwarfed Madara, and has beaten Madara badly, to the point that he was barely alive. Still, Madara wasn't going to give up, and with his last bits of power, he activated the infinite Tsukuyomi, placing everyone under the Genjutsu, except Black Zetsu and Sako, who were unaffected. Sako being unaffected, was a huge shock to the Black Zetsu and Madara, who realized right away, that they are in danger. So, before Sako could kill Madara, and ruin everything, Black Zetsu reacted, and much to Madara's shock, and Sako's confusion, he stubbed Madara through the back, and into the heart. This led to Zetsu's real identity being revealed, and his goal being revealed as well. Madara realized he was being used all the time, and Sako realized that there were secrets in the Akatsuki, B-E-N-E-E-T-H the other secrets. With the infinite Tsukuyomi being cast, and with Kaguya being revived, Sako realized that she is the one who will have to deal with this right now, as she can't possibly allow someone as powerful as Kaguya, to run free, and do whatever she wants to. This of course, wasn't a part of Naruto's plan. He planned for Sako to battle at his side against the dragons, but she will now have her hands full against someone whose power actually surpasses hers, and is on the same level as Taiyas and Teya. Those two are the strongest of hybrids Naruto created, and Kaguya is on their level. Sako is just slightly below, when it comes to pure power. Fortunately for Sako, she has a very interesting special power, and her speed is what she is sure, will allow her to keep up with Kaguya, and eventually defeat her. The only question is, how to defeat someone who is immortal, can't be killed, can only be sealed away, and Sako doesn't have any sealing abilities. That will be it for this video if you want more comment down below, like, subscribe. And see you guys later.